Good morning. I'm Mark Andrews, the Bishop of the Diocese of California, and I am here to welcome you, Michael Good morning. I'm Mark Andrews, the Bishop of the Diocese of California, and I am here to welcome you, Michael Bruce Curry, Presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church, to Grace Cathedral and the Diocese of California. Your leadership of our church has been transformational and continues to be. From the very beginning of your time as Presiding Bishop, you helped define where we were going as the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement. Uh, you and President of the House of Deputies, Gay Clark Jennings, defined for us three mission imperatives that would guide us for the whole time of your time as our primate, uh, that is climate care, creation care, evangelism, and racial reconciliation. Later, you helped us understand that our call is to be loving, liberating, and life-giving in the way of love, and you helped us understand the steps to live into the way of love. Now we're all eagerly anticipating your just-released book, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times. In addition to all those gifts that you have given this church and this world, you have been, as was said at the time of your election as presiding bishop, a bishop who is preaching a revival of the Episcopal Church. I welcome you to Grace Cathedral and to the Diocese of California. I'm standing in front of this pulpit in Grace Cathedral where you have preached twice before and where before you great people of faith have given prophetic words to the church and to the world, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, just days after the Selma March in 1965. Thank you for giving us the gift of your time. I also want to say a word to the community that is gathering virtually here at Grace Cathedral this morning. We welcome you, whoever you are and wherever you are, this place, this sacred place, works hard to be live up to our motto, that is, we are a house of prayer for all people, regardless of race, creed, code, orientation, any other self-definition or definitions imposed upon us. We are glad you are here. And to the Diocese of California, I know that many of you are gathering here in this virtual space at Grace Cathedral to here our presiding bishop preach, but also some of you are using his sermon in your own gathered community so you can pray the local prayers you need and want to pray. Uh, I send love and blessing to all of you. Bishop Curry, the Diocese of California and Grace Cathedral are special places in the beloved community. For almost 14 years, we have been intentionally living into what does it mean to be the beloved community. We've been searching and questioning and courageously moving forward with our 
ever-evolving understanding of what the beloved community is. For uh, over 160 years, the Episcopal Church in Northern California, in this Bay Area, has been holding a light, giving life-giving waters to a world that needs our Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, holding values that are at the essence of what it is to be human and to be Christian. I am so proud to be and grateful to be the bishop of this diocese and to welcome you and to welcome the diocese and the congregation gathered for the 11 o'clock service on St. Michael and All Angels 2020 in Grace Cathedral. Blessed be the one holy and living God.
God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted in a wonderful order the ministries of angels and mortals. Mercifully grant that as your holy angels always serve and worship you in heaven, so by your appointment they may help and defend us here on earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Revelation to John. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accusers of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. 
for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Savior of our gospel, the holy gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On behalf of your brothers, sisters, and siblings who are the Episcopal Church, wherever they may be, I bring you their greetings, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we are observing the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels. That would ask you to consider two passages of Scripture. One from the book of Revelation, the story of Michael casting the devil out of heaven, from Revelation 12. The other from John 13, the words of Jesus spoken at the Last Supper. Start with the words of Jesus. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For by this, the world will know that you are my disciple, that you have love for one another. And from Revelation 12, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angel thrown down with him. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. I want to talk about the courage to love. Courage to love. So let me back into it. Your bishop, Bishop Mark, and I have been friends for many years, going back to his time serving in Alabama and when I was in North Carolina. And it was during that time when I was about to go on a sabbatical leave uh, after having served seven or eight years um, in North Carolina, the diocese granted me a leave. And so I was getting ready to do that, and your bishop and I had been talking for a while about um, avocational things that I could do that would actually get my mind off of work that would be not only relaxing, but might be beneficial and blessing. And so he talked me into taking up the violin, and I did. And it turned out to be a real blessing for me, maybe not for anyone who heard it, but for me. And so I started taking violin lessons on sabbatical and continued taking my lessons with a wonderful teacher who had taught at Meredith College, a liberal arts school for girls here in Raleigh, North Carolina. She had taught for 50 years and was, and was then retired when she was working with me. One of the things I learned about the violin, and it's true of string instrument, is that without tension on the string, Without tension, there is no music. Now, you can't have too much tension, but you can't have too little. Just the right amount of tension between the ends of the string make it possible when the bow is proper, there's enough tension for there to be music. There is tension between these two texts. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. And there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels against the dragon and his angels. Love. War. Nonviolence. Violence. There's a tension in these two passages held in the same, the same Holy Scripture. And yet I want to suggest that the tension is not a flat-out contradiction. That would be too much tension. The tension is one that one of my professors in seminary, the late Brevard Child, uh, was the leader of a movement called Canonical Criticism, in which he said it's important when interpreting sacred texts to remember that the rabbis included all those texts in what is now the canon um, of the Hebrew Bible, and that the church um, included all of these texts 
in what is the canon of, of the New Testament, that, that, that there is a built-in tension that undoubtedly the framers of our scriptures, guided by the Spirit, they knew the tension was there, and they left both texts in Holy Scripture. When I look at that tension and look more deeply, I think I can see it. Jesus, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. He says it in John's gospel at the Last Supper. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple, my disciple, that you have love for one another. At the Last Supper in John, chapters 13 through 17, um, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Um, as in John, at the Last Supper, chapters 13 through 17, a remarkable set of passages where Jesus is giving his disciples what, he, what they need to know when he's not with them physically anymore. He says to them, greater love has no one than this, but that they give up their life for their friends, and I have called you friends. Love. Love is Judas slithers out of the room. Love. Love, as Peter would soon deny him in spite of his protestations. Love, when he's arrested in a garden. Love, when he's pulled off his knees by soldiers. Love, when he's tried unjustly and convicted of crimes he never committed. Love, when he's tortured. Love, when he carries a cross. Love. And those hands that only healed are nailed to wood. Love. His mama watches him die. Love, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Love, when it is finished, and he gives up the ghost. Love, when they put him in his mama's arms. Love. When a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, buries him in his tomb. And love, when the earth would quake days later. Love, when God would raise him from the dead. Love, when he would appear to his followers. Peace be with you. Love. But then, in Revelation, there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels fighting against the dragon and his angels, and then they kick the dragon and his angels out of heaven and kick him down to earth. What's going on there? Raymond Brown, the late Raymond Brown, a Roman Catholic, uh, a biblical scholar, a Johannine scholar, in one of his books, talks about the Johannine communities, the communities that, that trace their, uh, Christian communities that trace their origin to the teachings of, of John, possibly the author of the gospel, we don't know, but certainly the, the gospel itself, and then three epistles, first, second, and third John, and possibly even the book of Revelation, while they may or may not be the same individual John, they probably arose out of a common community that traced its origins to the understandings of Jesus that, that John held. And that in that, those collections of works, if you look at the gospel, love is the cornerstone of, of Jesus' teachings in John's gospel, and it gets picked up again in the epistles. In 1 John chapter 4, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God, and those who love are born of God and know God. Why? Because God is love. And yet the book of Revelation is seen as having come out of those same communities. What is the relationship between a gospel of love and a book with war? In heaven, if you look back, the book of Revelation may well date from, clearly dates from a period of persecution, whether it was the period under the emperor Domitian or the period of the emperor Nero, we're not sure, but it was a period of persecution. And those who stood for love, those who dared to follow Jesus in his way of 
unselfish, sacrificial love that works and seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others. When the community that was built around this love, Raymond Brown says this community was fashioned around love and these were churches where men and women were equals. These were churches where slave and free were equals. These were churches that actually lived out the egalitarian teachings of the kingdom of God, of the beloved community. That's what these Johannine communities were and they were being persecuted by the empire of Rome. And the book of Revelation was composed to tell them, hold on, hold on. You are in a struggle. You are in a struggle for good. Hold on, not with the weapons of hate, not with the weapons of violence, but with the weapon of love, with the ways of love that can change and transform our jangling discords and our disconnects with one another into, as Dr. King said, a glorious symphony of beauty, of hope, of beloved community. Hold on with the discipline of a soldier. Hold on with the courage of a soldier. Hold on in the cause of truth. Because in the end, love's going to win. If you read further in the passage from Revelation, after the devil is kicked out of heaven, the text then says, Then I heard a loud, a loud voice from heaven saying, Rejoice you heavens and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath. Check this out. Because he knows his time is short. Hatred will not last forever. Violence will not last forever. Injustice will not last forever. Wrong will not last forever. James Russell Lowell. Uh, who was part of the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, um, James Russell Lowell, um, who, who, who lived through the Civil War, James Russell Lowell, who saw the indignities and injustice of the Spanish-American War, was someone who fought and labored for the causes that were right. And even in days when he wasn't sure if right would be might, if right could win the day, he wrote these words, and I quote, truth may forever be on the scaffold. Wrong may forever be on the throne, but that scaffold that sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Courage to love. That's what Revelation was trying to teach. The courage to love. That's what we see in Jesus. The courage to love. That's what we are called to as his followers. Charles Marsh in his book on the civil rights movement and its spirituality and theology at one point says this and I quote, Jesus began the most revolutionary movement in all of human history. It was a movement of people who were committed to Jesus and his way of love. And that way of love transformed their lives and it transformed the world around them. And my friends, what Jesus and his way of love did in the first century can continue to do now in the 21st century, in spite of odds, in spite of opposition, in spite of injustice, in spite of wrong, in spite of what we often see in front of us, in spite of it all. Love's going to win. We must summon the courage to love. One of my favorite books that I periodically pick up and reread uh, was Paul Tillich's The Courage to Be, written with uh, lectures that he gave years ago, um, I think in the early 1960s. And in that book, he talks about faith and the courage to be. And he says, faith and the courage to be. Faith is not the absence of doubts or uncertainties. It's not even sometimes clenching your fist and raising it to heaven. It's not even um, the absence of frustration with the way things are. He said, no, 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 no. Faith is the courage to be in spite of what you can see. 
Faith is the courage to hope in spite of hopeless situations. Faith is the courage to be in, in spite of the odds being against you, in spite of all of the evidence that you can see. Faith is the courage to hold on to love in spite of hatred. Hold on to compassion in spite of the desire to be. And the courage to love is the courage of life. Mahatma Gandhi said it this way. I regard myself as a soldier, a soldier of peace. For I know the value of discipline, the value of love, of truth, the power of love. I'm doing this sermon on Wednesday at the very hour that the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg her body has been carried by some of her law clerks into the rotunda of the Supreme Court where the words equal justice under law are inscribed above the temple. There was someone who dared to live Life not for self alone, but for others. That's love. There is a life of one who was willing to stand up when others would sit down. That's love. There was one who did not take up the sword, but took up the pen, took up the argument took up the cause even before it was popular or safe to do so dared to be a woman and take her place in the councils of law there was a woman who showed the way and but a few weeks before I saw another casket, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, draped in an American flag. That one was carried in a caisson, with horses carrying it. And that one crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And that one carried the body of the late Congressman John Lewis. There was another one who stood not for self alone, but for others, who believed and said that love is the way to save us all. For love is the mother of justice. Love is the mother of compassion. Love is the mother of equality. There was John Lewis. There is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And now, oh, I, there must be some rejoicing up in heaven because the saints have gathered in. Those who stood the test of time. Those who did not hate, but stood for what was loving, what was just, what was humane, what was decent, Kind, what was meant for us all. We too, like them, like saints who have gone before, like the Jesus whom we follow, must take up the cross of hardship and sometimes suffering and follow in the footsteps in the way of love. And fear not. Fear not. Because in the end, love's going to win. Though the cause of evil prosper, 
Yet his truth alone is strong. Though her portion be a scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold that sways the future, and behind the dim unknown, standeth God, keeping what? Above his own. Walk together, children. And don't you get weary. Because Ruth Bader Ginsburg, John Lewis, C.P. Vivian, and a host of others. Don't you get weary. Because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us raise our prayers to the God of angels and mortals. God of celestial beings, by the work of angels, awaken the church to your dream for creation. By the church's worship and witness, scatter your justice like dust across the earth. With all your saints, we pray. Hear our our prayer. prayer. God of heaven and earth, cast down the powers of deception and raise up noble leaders who defend the causes of truth and right. With all your saints, we pray. Hear our prayer. God of all creation, crown humankind with mercy. Through us, redeem the earth from destruction and renew the lives of those most affected by climate change. With all your saints, we pray. Hear our prayer. God of loving kindness, visit any who are incarcerated, sick, or suffering, especially from COVID-19. We remember those nearest to our hearts, naming them silently or aloud. Bless them with complete healing. With all your saints, we pray. Hear our prayer. God of rejoicing, gather your children who have died, especially Doris Cyril, Alice Ryan, J. Delino Ellis II, Gilbert Heller, Cheryl Furness. Together with Luella Anderson, William Banks, Kirsten Brydon, Rolf Chin, Thomas Toll, Ibrahim Mohammed, E.C. Longhi, and those at rest in our columbarium. And we remember our own beloved dead, naming them silently or aloud. Open to them the gates of heaven. With all your saints, we pray. Hear our prayer. God of all peace and reconciliation, 
We give thanks to you for the human family and for the world we share with all your creatures. Inspire us to build bridges that connect us, that we might more perfectly respect the dignity of every person. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also, and also with you. Peace. Peace, sister. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It's such a pleasure to have you all here today um, to be part of this service. We're especially grateful for um, Bishop Michael Curry for today's sermon. Um, immediately following the service, there is a, um, a special um, uh, forum with Mark Andrus, Bishop Mark Andrus, our bishop, and the presiding bishop. Um, it'll take place at 12.30 p.m., so please join us for that um, special event today. Um, we've been recently starting up a new service at Grace Cathedral. It's an 8.30 a.m. Zoom service. Um, it a, has a brief sermon. It's a, a, a relatively short service. Um, and you're welcome to join us. It's uh, a chance to share in, with informal conversation um, and to see our friends, to, to be together, to worship. I also want to talk to you today about um, all, that takes, all that makes this possible here. Um, Together, hopeful and strong, we are a community of prayer and service for the city and for the world. And all of us together, by our gifts to Grace Cathedral, make this possible. Today, I want to hear from Joe Garrity about his decision to give to Grace. Hi, my name is Joe Garrity. I've been a member of Grace Cathedral for about seven years. When people talk about giving to grace, they often talk about the congregation, how loving it is, and it is. They talk about how great our clergy are, and they are. They talk about how beautiful the services are. What actually drew me to Grace Cathedral is this building, this incredible sacred space. When I joined Grace, I joined the docents, which is a group of volunteers, and what we do is we take people on tours of the building. So we have high school kids from Utah and senior citizens coming from Northern California. And we take them around the building and we tell them about the art and the architecture. And they tell us incredible stories about memories some of them have of being here as children for Christmas concerts or the parents being married here. So when I give to Grace, I do give for the congregation and the clergy but I also give for this absolutely incredible space that we all love, and I hope you will give too. Joe's got to be one of my favorite people. It's so good to hear from him. During the music that follows, you are invited to give to Grace Cathedral. Thank you very much for your generosity. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, holy one of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy.
Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. You call the people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and to give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, and reconciled us to you and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread. And when he gave, had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, and gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the incarnation, the cross and tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ and in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together, each in the language of our heart, as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. are the gifts of God for the people of God. Gracious God, we love you above all things and are grateful that you are with us. Come spiritually into our hearts, unite our entire selves to you, and never permit us to be separated from your presence. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. the angels of God watch over you. May Mary and the saints pray for you and the blessing of the source of all being, the incarnate word, and the abiding spirit, one God, be with you now and evermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.